Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, to make this life count, and to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Today on our program, I have the pleasure to interview Bruce and Robin Williams. Bruce and Robin just retired after 50 years in the full-time ministry. They're in Orange County, California. And what's interesting about Bruce and Robin, although there are many, many things that are interesting, is that they were both uh, students in Gainesville, Florida in the late 60s and early 70s, and they were part of the Crossroads Church of Christ. And the Crossroads Church of Christ is uh, very instrumental in the in our family of churches, the International Churches of Christ, and the Crossroads Movement led to the campus ministry movement, and then <clears throat> that morphed into the Boston Movement, and then here we are today in the International Churches of Christ. And so today, we're going to be talking to Bruce and Robin about their experience in the ministry, what they saw back in the early days, and what they see as different between what happened there in the early days when literally hundreds of people were becoming Christians on a single campus in a year, in a school year, versus now, and their wisdom going forward into the future. So Bruce and Robin, Robin, welcome to the Rob Skinner Podcast. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's great to be with you. Congratulations on your retirement. How many years in the ministry now? Well, if we had made it to June, it would have been 48, but... <laughs> We're 47 and three quarters. <laughs> I think that's good enough. Yeah. Now, Bruce and Robin, you guys have, uh, we've known each other since the late 80s when I when we were in the San Francisco Church of Christ together. And more recently, uh, we're not going to get into this, but you, you called us out of a church in Ashland, Oregon, and invited us to plant a church in Tucson, Arizona, and it's been a great relationship, and we've become best friends, and I'm so thankful for your mentorship and wisdom, and so I'm really thrilled about this time together. Let me ask you this question. 48 years in the ministry, ministry has an extremely high attrition rate. In fact, uh, one writer, Peter Drucker, said that ministry is the toughest job in the world. How did you manage to stay in for so long? Well, that's a good question. I think, I think, uh, you know, it all starts with a dream. And uh, I think when we became Christians and we started seeing what God was able to do, it really inspired us to want to go and do that other places. And uh, I think that that dream has never died. Mm. Uh, I think we've continued having that dream that's there have been times when it's faded uh but never gone out because we really believe that um what god has done in our lives he needs to do in everybody's and uh i think there are a lot of different reasons why we're able to make it as long as we are uh as long as we did i think um uh, no question about it, we had a lot of help, a lot of people that had been around us and had loved us and supported us. And uh, we've been in this together. Uh, you, have to, you have to have a community around you, wherever you're at, that you're a part of and that you share the same dream. Right. And I think that's kind of what we've done wherever we've been. We've we, we joined people that had the same dream of winning this world for Christ. And I think um, whether it's talking about when we first started in the campus ministry, going out, or whether it's leading churches, it's, it's being a part of uh, a community of people who have the same dreams and aspirations. That's great. Robin, you were raised in the traditional church of Christ. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. tell me, tell me, how'd you guys become Christians and how'd you get to Gainesville? What was the road to Gainesville, Florida? <clears throat> okay. Let's see. I was raised in a traditional church, went to church all my life. 
And I think that gave me a, a great faith in God, you know, that I believe in God. Um, but later in high school, I started dating Bruce and he, um, he was a year older than I was. So he went to Gainesville before I did. And um, when he would come back and share, cause we were, you know, dating, he would share things with me about what he was learning. And it really made me have to look at my uh, decision that I made when I was 12 um, and how deep that went. Mm -hmm. And so I learned a lot from him. He was the one who actually studied the Bible with me and helped me see that, you know, it wasn't just believing in Jesus. It was actually putting what he taught into practice. Wow. And there were so many things that I was not putting into practice that I had to really think through that and um, not just rely on what I'd always done, that I'd always gone to church, that I had, you know, not done this, that, or the other, but there were things that I didn't know mm -hmm. God wanted, expected from me. Mm -hmm. So um, he studied the Bible, and I was going to some of the retreats up there, and I was baptized when I was 18 at a retreat in um, high school. I think <laughs> uh, but I already graduated. So uh, it was, I graduated and then I moved. Actually, I didn't move. I was going to a retreat and was baptized up there. That's great. And I finished one year of junior college in uh, South Florida and then decided to go after I was baptized to Gainesville. Okay. To my education and also grow spiritually. Okay. Now, Bruce, you went to a Church of Christ college initially. Gainesville wasn't your first choice. What, what happened there? How'd you, how'd you get there? Well, I probably need to back up. Okay, go uh, ahead. So, uh, I, my initial exposure to uh, campus ministry movement, what became the campus ministry movement, uh, began when I was in high school. Uh, I was about to start my senior year in high school in uh, Miami, and uh, uh, two ministers uh, were going up to a seminar in Gainesville, Florida, and I was good friends with them, uh, Nat Cooper and uh, Chuck Lucas, and I know, knew both of them and they had heard about this seminar that was starting in Gainesville. And so they asked me if I wanted to go with them. And I said, okay, sure, why not? And so that was in August of 1967. And when we got there, uh, it was like nothing I'd ever been a part of. They were probably about 75 people in attendance. And uh, there were these two men that had come there uh, from the traditional Church of Christ that uh, had uh, started, they had contacted Campus Crusade for Christ and they had uh, flown out to California and to learn what the Campus Crusade for Christ uh, movement was doing on the college campuses because up until that time, the uh, Churches of Christ, uh, the only kind of ministry that they had on state college campuses was what they call Bible chairs, which, which uh, basically was uh, uh, connected with uh, Church of Christ colleges and universities. And basically what they would do was offer Bible courses uh, on the state uh, in the, in the uh, Bible chairs at the state university level. And so they would uh, offer credit that could get transferred to the state universities. And so there was really no evangelism movement at all in the Church of Christ for the state college campuses. And so uh, there were uh, a couple of men that had learned about Campus Crusade for Christ and they wanted to know more about it. And so they flew out here, went to a conference, came back, and they got some funding to begin uh, two pilot programs 
of campus ministries built on the same kind of format that the campus crusade for Christ uh, movement was built on. And that was the face-to-face evangelism and the Lordship of Christ. And so basically what happened was uh, uh, there were two colleges that were selected. They had interviewed a number of different churches to see who would be open to this pilot program. And one was in, in Lubbock, Texas, and the other one was in Gainesville. And the two elders in Gainesville uh, that had been interviewed said, yeah, we want to be a part of this pilot program. And so the 1967 seminar was kind of the, uh, the, the beginning of that. And so they had uh, interviewed uh, Chuck Lucas to come up. He was uh, probably about at that time, 28 years old, something like that and had been serving as a youth minister in, in Miami. And uh, so they interviewed him and, and the elders hired him to be the campus ministry for this pilot program in Gainesville. And so this seminar in 1967 was kind of the beginning of that. I see. And so we went to the seminar, then came back and uh, it was all about go and tell the great things that God has done for you, kind of like the demoniac. That was a, mm. a key part of it. And so I came back, had my senior year of high school, and, uh, and Jump had moved to Gainesville during that time and started that movement. Uh, and he just started with a few kids that had come to Gainesville uh, and it checked, they were Church of Christ, uh, you know, preference. And that's how he started it. And they Okay, and so let, let me interrupt you there, Bruce. That's, that's something I want to talk about. This is something that's going to shock people. But back then, when you applied for a school, you actually put down which religious background you came from on your application. Is that right? And, that's and, right. and the elder of the church was also involved in the school administration isn't that right and so right. can you talk to can you talk a little bit about that and, and expand on that well he was the re- uh, one of the others was the registrar uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so that enabled us and it was access any of the denominations had access to this information and so that's kind of what Chuck did to try to find people that might be interested in becoming a part of this. So Chuck uh, went to Gainesville in 1967. I finished my senior year of high school and uh, I had been in correspondence with Chuck about where I should go to school. And at the time uh, he had recommended uh, Christian college instead of Gainesville. And so I ended up going to David Lipscomb University in Nashville for the first quarter of 1968 and uh, in the fall of 1968. But I hated it so much because uh, it was such an ungodly place. Here I was at, on this Christian college campus and yet uh, the dorm that I lived in, it was just, uh, it was no, no difference than any other uh, place. And, and so I ended up talking to Chuck and saying, you know, I want to come to Gainesville. Uh, I, I'm not happy here. I, I want to be a part of something bigger than this. And so, um, you know, he, he arranged it uh, through Richard Whitehead uh, to, to have me transfer. And so I transferred in January of 1969. Wow. So Chuck Lucas was your youth minister in high school. Is that right? Well, he was a youth minister at one of the other churches in, in, uh, while I was in high school. And he, we had had him come up and speak at different teen rallies and that kind of thing. And so uh, that's how uh, Rob and I ended up meeting him. Okay. Wow. Okay. That's, that's powerful. So that, that's how you got to Gainesville. Really interesting story. Yeah. Now, 
from what I've heard about the Gainesville ministry, the Crossroads Church of Christ, it was right there in Gainesville, Florida, college town. Um, I've heard varying numbers, hundreds of college students, hundreds of baptisms, like 100 baptisms in a single school year. Do you have any numbers on that or any idea? Can you tell me a little bit about, for, especially for people that have ne- you know, never heard this or can you tell right. me a little bit about the ministry? Well, when I got there in in uh, in January of 1969, um, we had about 15 students. Is what we had. So it was still in its infancy. Uh, Sam Lane was there. J.P. Times was there, and uh, and and then I arrived and. Uh, and so there were only a few students at that time. But as we began to share our faith on the campus, as we began to uh, really take seriously the Lordship of Christ, we started seeing God do amazing things. And, and of course, this was during a time, uh, if you know anything about American history, this was during a time where there was all kinds of chaos going on. Uh, the 1960s was, of course, the uh, racial uh, unrest and uh, the, the, all the problems with racism that went on in the middle 60s. Uh, and of course, uh, the, so we were going through that. And on top of that, we were going through the Vietnam War uh, was at its height during that time. And so... Uh, and there was also what, what the, the quote unquote hippie movement was also a part of this history where there was a rejection of traditional Christianity and a rejection of, 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 of belief. And Madeline Murray O'Hare was a big figure. Uh, she was the one, the first atheist that got uh, prayer thrown out of schools back in the 60s. And so there was a lot of questioning that was going on constantly about everything. And so when when we began to share our faith, we could not assume that anybody necessarily believed in God, Jesus, the Bible, anything. And so it it really caused all of us, and myself included, to really uh, ask deeper questions of myself what do I really believe? Why do I believe that the Bible is word of God? Why do I believe that God exists? Why do I believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And so there were different materials that we had to really study and read because people were, were asking us questions that we needed to have the answers to. Mm-hmm. And so as we began to reach out, we, we saw you know, God did some amazing things. And yes, they were, it was, it was exciting. And every year there would be more and more people get baptized in mm-hmm. Christ. And uh, it was a, a very exciting time. I mean, uh, but it, this was kind of a unique thing. There was, this was not happening anywhere else. in the Right. Church. It was so singular, just so, so out of the ordinary I know that there have been many, many, many leaders that came from Crossroads. I've met them over over the years, and many campus ministries were led there, uh, led by people that were trained at Crossroads. Um, can you share some of those names that have been sent out from Crossroads over the years? Well, and I can try. <laughs> just give it a shout. Robin, any names come to your mind? Well, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, I, I mentioned J.P. Times. He and I were the first ones to go out in 1972. He went to Maryland, and I went down to Miami. Um, I'd take but, Miami over Maryland any day. <laughs> uh, but, uh, he interviewed in Maryland. But chose yeah. <laughs> you were but, very, um, very smart there, Bruce. But J.P. had a great campus ministry there in Maryland, and and. There were some great brothers that, and sisters that were converted there. Um, 
but uh, Martin Bentley was certainly one. Tom Brown was someone. Kit McKean, Randy McKean. Wyndham Shaw. Wyndham Shaw. Jeannie Shaw. She was the daughter of the registrar. Yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, I think Cindy, Cynthia Powell was converted in Kingsville, so I believe. Um, but, you know. I know it's, probably, it's, it's hard to listen. There's many, many people, but yeah. certainly extremely influential people over the past 50 years came out of Crossroads. Very, very influential. And um, <clears throat> they went, they went into a lot. So many people went into the ministry. Certainly there was a trend. I mean, there's a culture there. What was unique about the Crossroads culture or the atmosphere? What, what was being emphasized? What was going on there? that made it so different and had made it stand out. Robin, you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, I think as Bruce was mentioning earlier that um, there are three basic, very basic convictions that we all have. First of all, that God is real. Uh, number two, Jesus is the son of God and was the answer, was the gift, was um, for, our, for our sin that we needed to confront and face. And <clears throat> I think thirdly, that, um, you know, God's church was a part of God's plan. Mm -hmm. And that we, we believed in God and Jesus, the Bible and his church. And those four things kind of outlined everything that we did. And the culture was for me, like family. Um, it was one where we were in each other's lives, we helped each other, we studied the Bible with each other, we encouraged each other in our devotionals every Friday night, um, but we also uh, reached out to people and knew that, you know, God gave us a gift that we wanted to share with other people. And those are the things I remember, you know, definitely being encouraged. I mean, we would sing at devotionals for hours. Mm. We would sing at the union steps, you know. Uh, we would go out sharing. We would have student suppers um, that the married people uh, made for us every Sunday. Mm. And it just created this, not just a dependency, but a desire to be with each other. That's great. And um, those are some of the things I remember. Yeah. Back well, you know, you bring up the name Chuck Lucas, and I, I've heard some things about Chuck Lucas that he was an incredibly talented uh, person, a song leader, preacher. Uh, you've talked about him, Bruce, and and can you tell me a little bit about him? What was what? Can you tell me about? He was the campus minister, and just tell me a little bit about Chuck. Well, I think that. Uh... Chuck had the gift of preaching the word of God in a very powerful way, in a way that made you want to listen. And uh, I loved the way that Chuck read the word of God in every sermon. I mean, it was always so powerful. Um, I think that um, he definitely had um, gifts and abilities that uh, continued to evolve. He started out as a campus ministry minister there, and about two years after I had gotten there, he became the uh, the, the preacher for the campus ministry. And uh, Sam Lang was um, asked to serve as the campus minister, and so that was all happening right toward the end of my stay there. Uh, so. He, but he was a very dynamic, powerful preacher of God's word, and uh, he uh, def definitely did a great job in training uh, us to depend on God and his word, and he was very innovative. He, he was very creative. Uh, he was not a, you know, okay, this is the way we've got to do it. There were a lot of things that we were trying and experimenting with uh, that some of them worked and some of them didn't, but we were open to uh, really letting God lead us and 
uh, one of those things was soul talks. We started out having these brew Bible talks uh, in the dorms and in the uh, fraternities and sororities, which was something that was so out of the box thinking that you could actually go inside of the fraternity house and have a Bible study for an hour where you just sit down uh, on the floor with a bunch of guys and you talk about the Bible and you, you have questions and answers. Uh, and so all of that was being done all over the entire campus. I'm, I mean, the goal was to have a soul talk, a men and a women's, and they were always divided up into men and women's. Uh, and uh, the goal was to have them in every fraternity, sorority, and, and dorm on campus. And I don't know if we ever got there, but that was our, our mission, our goal wow. was to do that. That's amazing. It's interesting. Yeah, Go ahead, Robin. I had one thing talking about Chuck. I just want to say uh, he, he was a great leader, great speaker, but he also had a great wife. And I just wanted to mention that she was, you know, and thinking about how you stay in a in the ministry for so long, it is a couple that work together in a great mm -hmm. way. And Anne yeah. was a great example to all the women. She was very available to the women. She taught us, you know, the things that we needed to learn as as young women <clears throat> in, in, in school and then getting married and being single. And she just had a great impact. She was, um, to me, uh, uh, a great, Part of the reason why Chuck was able to do as much as he did. Right. And, and, and jumping off on that, I know she's written some cookbooks, some hosp the hospitality handbook is, is a book that Ann Lucas wrote. And also one, one thing I think you mentioned is that in the early days, uh, she wanted to find a way to serve the college students and put on churchwide meals for the college students. Can you talk a little bit about that, Robin? Yeah, those were our student suppers that um, she was able to, you know, organize the, the married sisters um, and they would come up with meal plans for every Sunday, cook it and provide it and allow us to eat every Sunday night before church, right? We yeah. had church on Sunday night, so we would come early and have dinner before we went to church. Yeah, back then. We had Sunday morning service. We had Sunday night service. We had Wednesday night service. We had Friday night devotional. And we had a soul talk every week. So that was our routine and our schedule. Well, you guys had a very relaxed schedule back then. Obviously, yeah, it was. you needed to get more committed. I know. That was our problem. <laughs> That's amazing. That's crazy. Now, one thing that makes me think... When you're bringing it up, if there was a, a men's soul talk. There was a women's soul talk. Yeah. Clearly, I mean, that must have been revolutionary right there. You've got women leading small groups. Women are spearheading the evangelistic thrust. Can you talk a little bit about that, Robin? Um, yes, that was quite the experience for me. I think after I was, uh, I've been baptized, been a Christian for about six months. The women's ministry leader um, had me meet with her and asked if I would lead a Bible talk. And, you know, I told her, of course, but I do not know how to do that. And um, so she was just looking for people who were willing, and I was willing to learn how. And we would have, I think, if I recall correctly, um, meetings with all of the Bible talk leaders and have what we called mock soul talks where each person would come in with a short Bible talk charge and uh, present it and then get input and feedback from the people that were in that meeting who were the quote, non-Christians or Christians in the Bible talk. And so it was a very hands-on learning how to do it. And, you know, that gave me confidence to believe that I could. And so, uh, Jerry Lang was my roommate in, um, in one of the dorms, and we had a Bible talk. I think it was at 9 or 10 o'clock at night every week, and um, 
we were able to see, I think, two people converted wow. uh, off, off in that dorm. So when we were there, That's... I was only there about two years. So uh, in in Gainesville, only two years. Yeah. Okay, so you sped it up because you wanted to get married. Is that right? Can that's you t- right. That's can you tell right. a little about your courtship and how you guys got married? Uh, <laughs> you met in high school, well, obviously. So you uh, can- we we met in high school. We went to the same church in high school, uh, but we didn't date then until uh, I went off to college that summer. Before I went to college, uh, I asked Robin to be my girlfriend so we started dating and uh and then i went to that christian college for one quarter and then i transferred to gainesville and when i was in gainesville uh it didn't take very long for me to realize that i had never made jesus the lord of my life and so on january 27th 1969 i was baptized and made jesus lord of my life um uh, we, uh, I continued to talk to Robin about, um, you know, what I was learning and that kind of thing. And initially she seemed, uh, open, uh, to what I was sharing, but there came a point in time where it became obvious that we weren't on the same page and we didn't have the same convictions. And, uh, and so we ended up actually breaking up uh, uh, a few months after I was baptized. And, uh, and then the, it was the fall of that year that um, she uh, herself was baptized. And so then the next year she moved up to Gainesville and, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we dated, but it was just, it was not steady until she asked somebody else or somebody else asked her to go out on the date. And it was the same weekend that we were going on a date and um, on Valentine's weekend. And I, it, it kind of pushed me over the edge and I said, okay, we need to go steady. If you be willing to. <laughs> need to take her off the market. Yeah. I, I realized that I can't play around here if I really care about it. So that's right. Uh, we ended up, you know, getting dating for all, all the way to 1972, and then we got married two weeks after we uh, graduated from that's, college. That's great, boy. That's I could talk a lot more about that, but that's exciting, especially getting married that early and uh, things like that. You know. Bruce, when hearing you talk, I go, okay, soul talks, Bible talks, that's, that's kind of a staple. That's an assumption that, that especially if you were converted in the Church of Christ or the, the, uh, any of the international churches of Christ, Bible talks have been a big part over the past 50 years. And yet hearing you talk, that was just uh, something that you came up with to try to solve a problem to reach people where they're at. Yeah. And it's just powerful to me to see the kind of creativity that you were using. Now it's become an assumption or something we don't even think about, but it was just one one tool that you were using to try to reach people. Really very, very powerful. But I think that's why this discussion is so interesting because the Crossroads Church, that that movement started so many things that are still still going. There's still yeah. momentum from the things that began during that time. Um, one another discipling, dis, you know, prayer partners, um, right. you know, reading a book, The Master Plan of Evangelism talks about one another discipling. And Jay Adams' book, Competent to Counsel, talks a lot about calling people to really repent of sin and that that solves a lot of problems for people. Um, can you talk a little bit about the influence that those books have? Because I I, I certainly feel like when I read those books, I go, man, that, that I can see the repercussions even now in our family of churches. Yeah, that, all of this was brand new. Uh, the more we read the Bible, we saw that there were many things that we weren't doing in the, in the traditional churches of Christ that we needed to have been doing. 
And uh, I think one of the things that really stood out to us was the many, what we call the quote unquote, one another passages. When you look and you even do a, a topical study of this, it's incredible how many dozens of passages there are about loving one another and confessing your sins to one another and praying for one another and encouraging one another and admonishing one another and rebuking one another. There are so many things that I had never heard being applied at all in any church setting. And so we started really trying to practice that. And the, 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 the relationship that we had, uh, at that time, we called them prayer partners. And basically, that was a time where we'd get together with one other person and we'd uh, share with each other how we're doing spiritually. We'd confess our sins to each other. We'd pray for each other. And uh, it would be a, a regular weekly time that we'd be together. Uh, I think that evolved into what we now call discipling relationships. But it but was basically the same thing where we were really trying to apply the practical verses in the Bible. We were trying to practically apply what we saw as commands in God's word. And so that was one of the kind of basic tenets of the culture that we had there. Yes, we were a community as a big church, but we also had the one another individual relationships that really, really, not only called us higher, but really made all the difference, I think, in the spiritual growth of, of the church. Mm -hmm. And whereas I think before uh, that, that time, there wasn't that much emphasis on one another individual kind of relationships. Mm -hmm. As far as the uh, evangelism uh, is concerned, um, yeah, I think the the, the book Master Plan of Evangelism uh, was definitely the first book that we read in our training classes. Uh, and it was just, it was the how, how did Jesus multiply? How did he begin his movement? And as that book outlines, we need to, we need to do the same thing. We need to do exactly what Jesus did. How can we improve on what Jesus did? Right. right. And so, uh, and, and again, this was, this was new. This wasn't something up until that time, pretty much the evangelism that had been done in the churches of Christ were more through what they called gospel meetings or tent revivals and that kind of thing where you would invite tons of people almost like the billy graham crusade kind of kind of idea of that's when you would evangelize and rather rather than rather than having one-on-one -on -one contact with people and doing it like jesus did it. and so it was it was a radical change in the, in the way that we did things wow that's just so fascinating during, in one of our conversations previously, Bruce, you talked about going to a, another Campus Crusade conference. Can you tell me a little bit about that and the impact that had? Yeah. Now, I told you about the, the, the seminar in 1967. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we had another one in 1968 in Gainesville. And then in, at the end of 1968, in December, there was those two uh, individuals that started this whole thing. Uh, one of them was Jim Beavis, and I can't remember the, the other man's name, but uh, they uh, held a, a uh, conference with the Churches of Christ in Dallas, Texas uh, in, the, in December of 1968. <laughs> And uh, Robin and I actually went to that conference um, in a yellow school bus along with a bunch of other uh, <laughs> students from Gainesville and uh, we attended it. And I don't remember how many were at that uh, seminar, but my guess would be, it could have been as many as a thousand. Wow. Uh, 
but uh, Chuck was one of the speakers for it. And uh, it was just a gathering of like-minded people from the Churches of Christ that were starting to feel the need to do more than what they had been doing. Mm -hmm. And so that was, uh, that was kind of the first national kind of movement that started. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'd like to say that everybody was excited about it, but they weren't. Uh, there was a lot of criticism from some of the uh, Church of Christ uh, preachers and uh, making all kinds of false accusations. We were starting to talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And again, I know this seems so ridiculous now, but 50 years ago in the Churches of Christ, there was not anyone that really talked at all about the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God, but the actual indwelling of the Holy Spirit was not even a concept at that time. Certainly not something that was generally taught. And we started teaching about it because it's very obvious in the Bible that we have the Holy Spirit. And we start talking about how the Spirit leads us. And uh, unfortunately, this ended up being uh, creating all kinds of stir and people were saying that we were saying that cats were being raised from the dead and all kinds of ridiculous kind of uh, things, but it, it's kind of what happens, you know, when people don't understand what you're doing and they're thinking, oh, you're going to go charismatic and, you know, you're going to start believing all kinds of things that we really didn't believe, but it was a radical thing at that time. Almost everything we did was radical. Mm. Uh, even women praying in the presence of men started in Gainesville. That was a radical change that had never been done anywhere in the churches of Christ where men and women would pray in a group together out loud. Mm. So there are so many things uh, time wouldn't permit me to. Right, uh, right. Well, get into all that. But it, it, it gave you an idea of we, we were, we really believed that we had to continue to uh, search out God's word and let the spirit lead us in the direction that we were going. Okay, great. And, you know, t just talking about innovations and, and groundbreaking stuff. Okay, 68, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. It's right during the height of the Civil War protests. Tell me about just how the how Crossroads uh, dealt with racial issues. What was going on there in terms of worshiping together and in the, the church? Great. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, uh, we were definitely the first integrated Church of Christ uh, in Gainesville, and uh, and uh, that was by design. The elders felt like. We, we, we needed to be uh, all together, that it was not, it, it wasn't God's will for us to be separated like this. And, uh, and it was a great, awesome experience. Um, Robin and I, uh, uh, my last year of high school was the first year I had, we'd had any African Americans in our high school uh, in Miami area. Uh, and so when I went to Gainesville, we had uh, some uh, br black uh, brothers and sisters there in the church, and it was great. Uh, my, uh, my first Christian roommate was uh, Matt McCurvey, and he was a black brother, and it was an incredible experience. Um, but it was definitely one of those things where uh, it was, this was cutting edge stuff. I mean, there were literally, out of the 25,000 students at the University of Florida, there were only 100 blacks. It's hard to even imagine. It's hard to imagine. that, But that's all there were in, in 1968 and 9. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it was definitely something that needed to change. Mm -hmm. And praise God, it did. But there was a mindset that we were going to love everybody mm -hmm. the same. Yeah, that, that that that's the way God did, and that's the way that we need to do. And, and I think that's become a real strength of the International Churches of Christ, a focus internationally, but also 
people from all nations, all backgrounds, uh, at every level. We've got it's something that we take for granted now. Yeah. Uh, our churches are 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 integrated, and um, there's a sense of of unity. I'm sure there's there's always progress to be made, but it's interesting that 50 years ago that was absolutely groundbreaking. You're right there in the heart of the South, Old Dixie, right there, yeah. and you've got blacks and whites worshiping together. It must have been just flat out amazing. It was. It, was it must great. have been amazing. But it really set a trend for all the churches that were influenced by that yeah. mm-hmm. campus ministry movement. Now, let's let's just keep going. Um, the, I find it interesting. The campus ministry used to be the growth engine for many of our churches. I mean, I grew, uh, I, I got baptized in a campus ministry under Tom Brown and his leadership in Berkeley, California, UC Berkeley. And at, at one point, there was right around 100 disciples on campus. It was, it was awesome. And Tom Brown, of course, came from Crossroads in that, that campus ministry. Um, but for many campuses, they're struggling to have a few baptisms in a year now. What's changed? What, you know, looking back, what's changed? What do you see? I know it's a big question, so I'll give you a chance to think <laughs> think about it. Well, it is something that I think we've got to really pray for God to give us wisdom to see uh, what is it that has changed. I mean, obviously, people change and the culture changes. Uh, you know, we, we see this in nations, and I think we see it here in America, where there is, uh, you know, people's openness can can evolve and change. I, I think it's a combination of things. I think um, there were a lot of things coming together there in the 60s and 70s and 80s that uh, I think, think contributed to people looking and searching for more. Uh, I think there are people that are still doing that. I think that we've got to figure out how to reach them. Um, but I, I do believe that the Bible is still the power of God for salvation. I believe that we've got the answers. And uh, But I, I do think that this is something that we've got to continually search for is what what is it going to take for us to reach the kind of people that we did back in those times. And uh, I don't have all the answers. I, I wish I did, uh, but I don't. Uh, I, I do know that that we've seen, uh, Rob and I have seen in every decade that we've been in ministry, we've seen this kind of growth. Uh, we saw it in the, in the 70s, we saw it in the 80s, and I think that was the time you were speaking about. And we saw it in the 90s here in, in, in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, at one time, we had over a 1,000 college students here in the LA Church. Uh, that was in the 90s. Um, I think uh, since that time, it's been more of a challenge. And uh, I, I do believe God can give us wisdom on how to do it. I think part of the ch- challenge is that we've not made the investment in the campus ministry. Uh, As the church has gotten older, I think there's been more of a tendency to spend money and resources uh, toward the people that are older than maybe those that uh, uh, that are younger. And I think we've got to get back to it there. I think there are some groups that are trying to do that more and, and put more resources. I still believe that college campuses uh, have the most open people mm-hmm. of any of anybody in, in the stage of life they're in because they're they're searching they're they're trying to figure out you know where they're going and what they're going to do with their lives and so I do believe it's still the most wide open uh, place to reach people but we've got to be willing to devote the resources to it and, uh, and, 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 and so I think 
there's been kind of a, uh, a trend to get away from that, but I think we've got to go back to it mm. if we're going to if we're going to see the same uh, results. Right. But, um, so that's probably what I would say. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Now let let's we've got a lot of people listening that are they're either in in campus, they're college students, or they're leading a campus ministry, or have led a ministry, or they're leading a small church. Um, you guys have been fired up for a long time, and what what advice would you give a person that really wants to make a difference with their lives, that really wants to um, do something serious and, you know, really make this life count. What, what advice would you give them going out and going, okay, I want to, I want to do something significant with my life. Robin, you want to answer that? I think I remember back when I became a Christian, you know, it was being aware of all the world situations and all the, the turmoil, <clears throat> you know, there was communist, you know, coming at us in the late sixties and things like that. And when I studied the Bible and saw that God was the answer for any and every issue that we had in the world, that motivated me <clears throat> to have that dream Bruce was talking about earlier to say, okay, if we can help people find that, that can be one of the greatest contributions we can make, you know, to this world. I think today, you know, there are a lot of ways people can make contribution to the world. And I think what it takes to be in the ministry is realizing that um, all of those things are a part of it, but there still needs to be a focus of some people who are willing to dedicate their life to helping people know God. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think when I got to that point, that's what motivated me to want to be in the ministry and continue to be in the ministry. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there are a lot of things today pulling us in different directions. You know, I know um, some student, I mean, the good thing was Bruce's dad and other people encouraged us to go to college. You know, whether we go in the ministry or not, that was one of their things, at least go to college. So if, you know, something didn't work out, you could fall back on something else. And we, we, we feel grateful for that advice. Um, and that was important during that time. I think today it's almost like, okay, you go to college, but today you need a graduate degree. You need a higher level. You need more and more, which is a way the world, you know, can pull us away from these things. And I think we've got to um, motivate and help people see that, yeah, anything the world has to offer us can be helpful. Mm. But you know, God ultimately is going to be the thing that helps most people. And so right. to me, it's motivating people to see that if they have, if they have the desire, if they have the talent, if they have the skills, if they have the, the zeal to help people do that, then <clears throat> that's what we need to, you know, kind of like Jesus, I believe, looked at certain people that he chose as his disciples because they had some of those things right. and developed that. Right. And, you know, really try to encourage those who have it to, to want to maybe put off graduate school or maybe not make as much money or maybe, you know, delay some other things they'd like to do. Right. Because I think that's what Jesus did. He called people, come to me now and I will make you what you need to be. Right. And, you know, I don't think that, like, from the... The campus ministry you came from, they sent out so many campus ministers. Back then, um, The it seems like the, the strategy was, hey, let's go plant campus ministries all over in existing churches of Christ. And I, I know that that later led to a lot of um, drama and, and some you know, stuff that went on. But there was a culture at Crossroads where, hey, I want to be a leader. I want to I want to serve God. And tons of people. I mean, I've known so many people that came out of Crossroads with that mindset. Um, and yet, you know, today, a lot of times people are uncertain about what, what they want to do and whether they want to give their, their life. What would you tell a person that's kind of debating, like, am, am I really cut out for ministry? I know it's a big question, but what advice would you give them, Bruce? 
Well, I think that, you know, I think everybody needs to be open to God putting a dream in, on their hearts. And uh, I do think that we, we've got to do a better job of, of inspiring our young people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I, when I, I was debating on whether or not I wanted to go in psychology and, and become a counselor or, or did I want to go into the full-time ministry. And the more I thought and prayed about it, the more I realized that the Bible really has the answer to where people are at. And if I really wanted to help people, this is the greatest way I can help people mm -hmm. uh, in, in the quickest way. Yes, I could make a contribution being a counselor, but the numbers of people that I could impact would be much greater right. uh, in the full-time ministry. And so I do believe that we've got to continue to help people, call people in the same way that Jesus did. He said, come and I will make you fishers of men. I mean, he immediately gave them a vision of what they could be. And, and, the, and the really neat thing about, you look at the 12 disciples, they're so totally different. Right. It wasn't like, okay, they were all one kind of personality, mm -hmm. or they all had one gift set. Right. And sometimes we can get into that mindset where, okay, it's only the type A kind of personality person right. that's going to be effective. And I think that's a worldly way of looking at it. Right. When you look at Jesus, Almost anybody can relate to somebody that's on in that 12, uh, that there, there are differences, but God can use us regardless of what uh, differences we may have. And yeah, some of us may be more skilled at public preaching, for instance, but others may be more skilled at organizing or more skilled at one-on-one -on -one kind of relationships. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are all kinds of people, and I, I would hope that more men and women would say, okay, where can I make the biggest difference with right. my life? Right. How can I make the biggest difference with my life? And if you really ask that question and ask God to uh, answer it, he, he'll make it clear. Right. That's not to say that full-time ministry is for everybody. Right. I don't believe it is, nor do I think once you start in the full-time ministry, you've got to stay there for the rest of your life. I think there are a lot of misconceptions of people that they go, well, this is a big decision. I, I don't know whether I want to do this for the rest of my life. Well, God may not want you to do it for the rest of your right, life. Right. Uh, what we've done is, uh, is, uh, is not usual. Uh, not saying it can't be done. It can, obviously. But uh, there may be a, a stage in your life where this is exactly what God wants you to do. Right. And, and I would say that with young people as well as uh, retired people or other people, there, there are different stages in life where God can use us in, in, in powerful ways. And I would hope that especially our young people would, would think more globally and spiritually in terms of where can I make the biggest difference in right. my life? How can I do it? Right, exactly. And I do think the full-time ministry is a great way to begin uh, that, that, that quest. Mm -hmm. And whether or not you stay in it, I think God will make it clear. Right. But I do believe it's, we, we, we need to give it our best. And, and that's what Jesus said when he called us 12. Now, when you guys were sent out, you, you, were sent out, you were the first campus minister sent out from the Crossroads Church. Is that right? Yeah. And where, where did you go first? Did you say Florida State? Oh, I went to Miami. Rob and I went to Miami. Uh, JP and Pat Times moved to Maryland. Okay, so Miami. What, what uh, University of Miami? or? Yeah, we were at University of Miami. Okay. And uh, that was a different dynamic um, because the... Uh, uh, it was more of a commuter school. It was a, a, a private Jewish university, uh, not totally Jewish, but predominantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, a, a more of a challenge for us 
and we but we we definitely did our best to reach out and to convert people and we did and how old were you guys um, when you went there uh, 22 22 you know that's one thing i've noticed is it it seems back in the day people were a lot younger when they went out whether leading a campus ministry or a church and and things have you know, it's now people are getting appointed as an evangelist, maybe 30, 35, 40. Um, you want to comment on that at all? Well, I think that, I, I do think that uh, we, we've got to uh, do a better job of, of really inspiring young men and women to, that, to believe that they can do more than they do. And I think we've got to all figure out how can we give them more opportunities because the last thing we, that we want to do is to hold somebody back because of their age. Um, you know, we were 22, very young, very green, didn't know a lot. Uh, when we moved to Tallahassee, when we were 23, we, we, we didn't know a lot, but we believed that God was with us. Mm. And, um, and we believed that, that his Holy Spirit was inside of us. And uh, that was it. And God moved, and he moved in a great way. And not just in our lives, but in so many others. Oh, my gosh, the influence. And, and we have to start with faith. And I think those of us who are older have got to give the younger people more of an opportunity. And I, I think... That's why Rob and I have really tried to spend our lives continuing to inspire younger people because we know that that's the group that has the greatest potential to to impact most people. Yeah, that's noble, and it's it's inspiring to see how you've stayed focused. You were leading a campus ministry till the till the day you retired. That's amazing. Well into your sixties. When I think back on your career, Bruce and Robin, I'm I'm personally inspired. You went, you led that campus ministry in Tallahassee, led the church up to about 500. Is that right? Well, in Tallahassee, uh, we uh, uh, we served as campus ministry. Okay. And we got the the, the campus ministry group to several hundred. Uh, the last year we were there, we had over 100 baptisms. Uh, and then uh, we, that was in 1979, and it became, it, what, what happened was it became very obvious to several of us who were out that trying to have a campus ministry in an existing traditional church of Christ was becoming, it becoming more obvious that it was a problem, it was a challenge. Right because you, you have the older people that really didn't have the same conviction as the younger people. And so it's creating this friction. And so uh, God moved in our hearts in 1979 to move back to Miami. There was a little church there of about 40 people who uh, really loved God. They wanted to make a difference in, 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 in the South Florida, but they needed help, they needed a leader. And, and so we decided the next position we were gonna take was to, to be the, <clears throat> was to be the full-time minister and not just a campus minister because we felt like the whole church team would be good together. And uh, so they offered it to us at 29 years of age. <laughs> And we went down there, and um, that group of 40 became a group of 500 by uh, 1986. That's amazing. uh, That is just flat amazing. And, you know, you, you went on beyond that and have led large churches in San Diego and, and Chicago. And then you led the, the Los Angeles church, which was, thousands and thousands of members. It's, pre, it's really amazing. Uh, but that's that's kind of a discussion for a, a later time. One thing that I, I love about you guys is you guys have a great marriage. 
And, and Pam and I, my wife, really appreciate your example in your marriage. And you seem you know, genuinely happy. And the ministry puts a lot of pressure on marriages and on parenting. And it, can you give me a, just throw me a bone here. Give me a couple things that you do to keep your love for each other strong. <laughs> well, you know, the, the ministry is, you know, people can say sometimes a blessing and a curse, you know, and when people, two people do the same thing working together, it puts a lot of stress on the marriage. But I think the ministry is probably one of the places you can do it uh, at least as well as any other place because of the focus that you have on serving God. And I think that's probably been the foundation of our relationship from the beginning, you know, is that even like we were talking about earlier when I became a Christian after, you know, Bruce did and we broke up, the foundation was I had to make that decision on my own. I had to have my own relationship with God. I couldn't do it for Bruce. I couldn't do it because I wanted to get married. I could only do it because this was my relationship with God. And I think that set for me a great foundation of how we were going to spend the rest of our life together is that any obstacle, any uh, disagreement, any argument was always going to, we were always going to look back to God. Right. And I'll share one funny story kind of in, in closing here <clears throat> or <laughs> to this point um, as to how we did that, because it's one of the things I appreciated so much about Bruce is that he, he knew God's word very well, but he could apply it very well. And so even when I was studying the Bible and even after we had gotten married, you know, he, he helped me know God's word more by using it. We would read passages together so that I could have a better understanding of my um, own sin and my pride. Because, you know, pride was probably the biggest obstacle for me becoming a Christian. I, I didn't look at myself as a prideful person because I didn't boast and brag about all the things I did, but I was very defensive about myself, and that side of pride, I didn't really understand, so it, it took a lot, actually, of uh, studying God's Word to help me see that, but we would use God's Word, and so he would help me with that, but I remember this time we had this rabbit, Brooke had a rabbit, and um, it was a big rabbit, so it had a cage outdoors. We were in South Florida, and it was getting kind of cold, you know, in the wintertime at night. And I said, honey, I think I need to bring the rabbit in because it's cold. He goes, ah, oh, it's, it's an animal. It's just a rabbit. It can survive. <laughs> and so, um, of course, Brooke's about nine years old, and she's concerned about it. I said, well, I went to God's Word. And I found the Brock proverb that said, a righteous man cares for his animals. <laughs> and so I shared that with him. And guess what? He brought the rabbit into the garage. And it, was, <laughs> it was safe and sound. That. <laughs> a funny story, but I think it, it shows how much we really believe in God's word and want it to right. affect and impact our life. Right. So that's and, one thing. And, and I think I think Robin, what you're saying there is that you actually bring bring the Bible, you know, home with you from church and actually use it in the context of a domestic situation between, you know, your husband and wife. And that and that's powerful. Where sometimes we compartmentalize and go, okay, Bible, that's for church or Bible studies, but at home, it's it's not. And what I hear you saying is that Bruce really actually would listen to the Bible when confronted and would also, you know, use it in the home. And so that's, that's great. Well, I want to, I don't want to take up any more of your time, but let me just ask you one final question here, Bruce. What do you see as the church's greatest challenge in the coming decades? Like you're, you're a senior uh, minister. You've been around for a long time from the very beginning of our, you know, campus roots. What do you see as the biggest challenge going forward over the next few decades? I think we got to, every, every full-time minister needs to be totally committed to training and raising up other young men and women and doing exactly what Jesus did. And unfortunately, I think too many 
ministers are content with being a, a minister of a local congregation and ministering to people in a, in a, in a congregational level, but not thinking, what can I do to multiply myself so that we can have more churches out there? Um, we're having more people retire than we are get going into the ministry. And I realize I'm one of the first ones to retire, but we've got a, a bunch of them coming up in the next decade, decade or two. And right now I don't see the, the quantity of men and women being trained and raised up. Uh, I take very seriously, you know, Jesus' example. When we talk about the master plan of evangelism, I've tried to live out that every decade of my life uh, as a Christian. And I don't see that same commitment mm -hmm. in most ministers today. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to be critical. Um, I, I know they love God. I know they deeply care about the church. Uh, they want to be used by God. But I don't see the same commitment to training and raising up young men and women. Mm. Uh, most ministers that I know today, they don't have a group of young men and women that they're training. Mm. And, and, and I, I, I don't believe that that's following Jesus' example. Right. I think they, and, and I understand the challenge because leading a church is not easy. It, it, it's challenging and there are a lot of needs. But if we don't, if we don't identify like Jesus did, men and women that we're going to pour ourselves into and train and raise up, then we're not going to have uh, leaders to lead these churches. Mm -hmm. Much less, we're not going to evangelize the world. Mm -hmm. And so, I do believe that people like myself, like you, like every minister, every there should be. It should be very obvious in every church who are the young men and women that you're training and raising up. Mm. You need to have, they need to know it and you need to know who they are. And it needs to be, the church needs to know. These are the people that I'm investing in. Because a, a minister can only do so much. He's got to train other people. Right. Do the work of the ministry. Ephesians chapter four. Right. And, and, and if we don't do that, you know, the churches, it's, it's, there's going to be a cap on what we can do. And so my, my appeal to every minister uh, is to ask the question, who am I training? Who are my group of guys? Mm -hmm. And for every sister, who, who, who are my group of women that I am training, that I'm raising up, that I'm willing to send out? Because when you look at that little church in Gainesville, and it was a little church, the, the community, as you mentioned, had less than 100,000 people in it. And, and yet, look what it, it, it spawned. Look what it began. Imagine all of us having that same mindset. What could we do in this world? Right. And we've had it before. I think that's what, and that, this is another discussion about the Boston Movement. And, we, we could talk about that maybe at a later date. But right. I think that's what motivated us to, to come together and, and to, to unite so that we could end up doing something in the world that we could not do individually. But we each have got to do our part. And I do believe that that's probably our greatest need and our greatest challenge uh, for the next several decades. Yeah. Well said and profound, Bruce. I, I, that just kind of sends chills down my spine. I, I feel like that's so valuable and important, and I, I really appreciate it. Spoken from experience. Bruce and Robin, I want to let you know how much I love you guys and how grateful I am for your influence in my life and my wife's life. Pam and I love you guys dearly and are so thankful for your discipleship, your mentorship over the past eight years now. It's been amazing and it's been great to become friends. And I'm yeah. so thankful for your guidance, your wisdom, 
and uh, appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoy every day of your retirement and uh, continue to influence. And I'm, I'm thankful that you are going to continue to disciple us. We appreciate everything that you give us. You're, you're a treasure to us. You've been such an inspiration to us. And, That's for and sure. We, uh, we, we consider it an honor to be friends together with you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And I want to thank you today for listening to the Rob Skinner podcast. My goal is to inspire you to make this life count, to live a no regrets life, and to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. If you enjoyed this program, I'd like to ask a favor. I'd like to ask you to subscribe, to rate, to review this podcast, and to please share it with your friends. Let people know about it so that they can go out and make this life count. Thank you very much.